Hey, this is Gemma and Shane. And today we're going to talk to you about the cemetery dig and its contents at the Holy Cross Cemetery, where Joseph Maskell was the pastor. This was mentioned in the Keepers. And just to refresh your memory, in the 1980s, Maskell was stationed at Holy Cross Parish in Baltimore. Now, the church itself is in Baltimore City. The cemetery is actually, I believe, in Glen Burnie, which is part of Anne Arundel County. And the priests lived not right where the parish church was, but they lived in a priest house in, on Warren Street in what an area of Baltimore that's called Federal Hill. And if you know the Inner Harbor, if you look across the harbor towards the Science Center, you can see a big hill. Federal Hill sits up high, and there's a beautiful neighborhood behind it. Warren Street is parallel with Federal Hill. There was also a rectory that was attached to Holy Cross Church, and Maskell did live there at one time. He originally lived in the priest house on Warren Street with several other priests. Among those was Father Carney. You've heard of his name. He's also on the bishop's accountability list as an abuser priest. The two of them lived in the priest house with several other priests. We have heard also from the housekeeper and the housekeeper's daughter that they were continually cleaning up pornography from those guys. Yeah, who knows what was going on over there. What we are going to talk about today is the 1992 burial of materials in Holy Cross Cemetery. Before we start talking about that, I wanted to bring up just slightly about while Maskell is at this church, you would call it a church, right? Correct. Okay, so while Maskell was at this church, there was actual, actually an, inc- an incident where someone was complaining that their loved one wasn't where they were buried, right? Correct. There was a family whose the mother died, and the family picked out the burial plot. Uh, there was a funeral, and when one of the children of the woman came back, she, her burial plot was not where they expected it to be. And when Maskell was questioned, he said that he needed that plot for something else. Now, he filed a charge against this family for harassment. And you probably can actually go online and find, if not, I'll make sure Shane can put it on the webpage. But he charged the family and said they were harassing him. He was the pastor. He had to make these decisions. But I've always felt like there was more stuff buried there and that maybe family plots were used to bury other materials in the cemetery. So why don't you talk to me about how the video we're about to watch came about? Okay. After the Keepers came out, I did a story with Christian Schaefer, who is a wonderful reporter with WMAR-TV. You can go to Christian Schaefer's fans and see this video yourself, but we are going to post it on the page for you so that you can look at it with us. This was not in the Keepers. The Tripod Media folks, Ryan White, Jessica Hargrave, and John Benham, the photographer, did not know of its existence until we did a story with Christian Schaefer, and he started looking. Now, what happened was he knew that at some point a video was made of the day that the materials were dug up from the cemetery. And he told me that Christian is really an investigative reporter. He doesn't just report on TV. He goes digging for us. He's a great advocate. He said he went into the archives in, you know, the room where all the videotapes are kept. 
And some of you might not know what a VHS tape is, but there were a lot of VHS tapes. They're about the size of a book, pretty big. And you would have to have a, what's the player, a VHS player? Okay. So he went looking. He was looking for the date that of the cemetery dig because he knew that. And in looking, he found a tape that was on the shelf. There's nothing cyber about this. It wasn't digital. It was actually a physical tape. And he looked at the date on it and looked at the news stories because they all would have been on one tape. And when he opened the cover of it, there was written in like pencil or whatever, something to the effect of papers and cemetery. The word priest might have been in there. So with that, he pulled the tape off the shelf and then began looking for a a VHS player to put it on. He did locate one in the studio. Again, it's WMAR. I really recommend that you follow Christian because he's a great reporter. Christian, anyway, he put, he found, they found one machine in their studio that would play this thing. So they played the tape. It's going to be, I think it's about a minute long, a little bit longer than a minute. And I'm going to walk you through it as we look at it. But what he did was played it. And then I guess, Jane, you can explain how they would take it from a VHS format to something else. Yeah. So right now, if you're not already, go on to the Out of the Shadows discussion page on Facebook. If you're not a member, answer the questions to get in. But you'll find around the same time that I'm sharing the photo, that there is a video, and this is going to be the video of the cemetery dig that we're going to be talking about. So if you go ahead and find that, you can push play when we tell you. But it looks like from the video, this was probably footage that they captured, but it's raw footage. It's not something that has been produced for a news segment or something like that. And it looks like from the video, they played it in a VHS player, but maybe they were using a recorder or a a digital camera to record the VHS player playing the tape. Because you'll notice in the video, there's an actual, the player is at the bottom and it's all, it's being recorded. So, so go find the video. It's just a minute and nine seconds long. We'll give you a minute to find that. And while you're doing that, Shane, if you guys understood what he just said, good for you. Cause I'm not sure I understood it, but what you're saying is they actually took a, they did a, photo recording of what was on the screen yes from the vhs tape yeah okay. so they're putting the vhs into the vhs player playing it and then using a still camera to record it on the tv or the screen okay don't yes. i sound tech savvy Woo. okay so anyway so i hope you're there now if you're not listen and then you can find it later christian uh we talked and he sent this to me and we decided to do a story with it. So he did play this two summers ago, or I, I'm losing track. Anyway, came to Ocean City, talked to me about this, and we took a look at what was on the tape. And I think you'll be surprised at what, and again, none of this was in the keepers. So if you missed the story on WMAR over a year ago, this will be new to you. So what you should be looking at is a the back of a woman with blonde hair and a gentleman with a red plaid shirt. The man's name is Mr. Story, S-T-O-R-E-Y. He was the groundskeeper for the Holy Cross Cemetery on Ritchie Highway, and he lived in a house that was in the cemetery. He had seven children. Um, He took care of the grounds, and... We're going to, if you push play, when I say play, you will be able to hear him talk to this reporter about what he was asked to do. I will add the beginning interview with Mr. Story. It's not audible. I don't think they had him hooked up with the mic yet. But after you see some more footage, then it goes, it jumps back and then you'll hear him talk. So go ahead and push. Okay. So. First of all, I want to know how many of you are saying, OMG, (laughs) because if you haven't seen it, that was a real eye open. So let me talk to you about what you just saw. What 
okay, the day that this interview was made was the day that everything was dug up from Holy Cross Cemetery. Two years before that, Mr. Story was approached by Pastor Joseph Maskell and told to dig a hole. The hole was 12 feet wide by 12 feet deep by 10 feet high. That's the size of a bedroom. He was told to dig the hole with his grave digging equipment and truckloads of these plastic bags and boxes came into the cemetery. He believes that it was a relative of Maskell's who was driving, but that's really irrelevant and we don't know. So the dump truck came and dumped in the first load, then went back. We're not sure exactly where the truck went back to. My guess is that A lot of this stuff may have been in the basement of the priest house on Warren Street where the priest lived, because that would have been a large place to leave everything. So after the truck left, Story, I guess he jumped down in the hole and took out some papers to see what was in there. And what he found was some photographs of girls with blouses open or no blouses on at all, it would be what would be considered pornography. And he took several of those pages. So when Maskell came back, or when the truck came back, it came back two more times. The materials were dumped into the hole, and Story was told to use his backhoe loader, fill in the hole, and make it look like it was never disturbed. Now, keep in mind, this didn't happen in the middle of the cemetery, okay? And what you saw in the keepers, that dirt in piles was not where all these documents were found because it's off of a fire road in the very back of the cemetery. And I can say from personal experience that my Jeep got stuck on trying to go down there and all scratched up, and so we decided that wasn't a good idea. But the filmmakers went back and tried to get a better picture. So anyway, back in the day, he filled the hole in, he planted it with grass seed, and nobody knew it was there. Now, because he had some of these documents, he began blackmailing, good for him, Mr. Story, Joseph Maskell. And Maskell paid to keep all this stuff out of the public eye. Mr. Story had a large family, and they have requested that we not bother them. They are long gone from that property. They live in different places, some in Baltimore, but we respect their privacy. We would never, ever approach them because they've requested that we don't. And as a side note, I'm going to really make a, a, a comment about all of us respecting the privacy of the people that we're talking to because some listeners or some readers on different Facebook pages are reaching out to the people that were involved in the events in the keepers and it isn't really fair those folks put themselves out there and we're going to ask you not to invade their private space So moving on to the video that you saw, what the camera panned was trash bags, black plastic trash bags, and in those trash bags were lots and lots of psychological tests. Now, last year, I had a Facebook friend who was a photographer, and what she did was she took still pictures of what you all saw. And she enhanced them and enlarged them. And then three or four of us in different parts of the country were able to see exactly what the documents were. So in doing that, we identified the psychology tests as a certain company that put the tests out. 
and we found that Maskell would not have been ever given permission to administer those tests. Only a psychiatrist or someone with a master's degree who was doing psychological testing, a psychometrist, would have been permitted to administer those tests. We've been told by many women who went to Keogh that when they entered the school in their freshman year, Maskell administered psychology tests to them, psychological profiles. So what we saw were some of the scoring sheets that would give you a number, and some of the numbers were relative to how likely would you be to follow suggestions. How likely are you to be influenced by other people? Also, questions about sexual activity. Um, we know that Maskell used Rorschach pictures to try and get girls to talk about genitals. So all of this stuff that was in that hole, some of it was years and years of these tests that he gave girls at Keogh. Maskell also was at different places before Holy Cross. We know that he was at the division of schools in the Catholic Center from 75 to 80 before going to Holy Cross. And at that time, he was evaluating foster children to determine the best placement for them. And I don't know if I need to say more about that, but what a vulnerable population that So it looks like he asked Mr. Story to bury all this stuff, but not destroy it. His reason being, this is his reason, that there was a burn on public, there was a ban on public burning and he didn't want to break the law. That's weird. (laughs) Yeah, that's weird. So what happened was like fast forward a couple years. So there's this hole in the cemetery that's all been reseeded, grown grass, whatever. And Mr. Story contacts a Baltimore City police officer and says he has some information for him. Now, if your name is Mr. Story and you're talking to a police officer, I guess the officer would be a little bit concerned. Is this like a real person? Or is this story? He meets up with him. Mr. Story tells him his story. And the officer reported back to his department about the cemetery dig. So on the appointed day, which is what you're seeing in the video, the police arrive and representatives from the archdiocese arrive. And I guess police officers were probably all over that place because I've been back to that cemetery and talked to the gentleman that now lives in that house. And he said he was too young to know any of this, but he said he knows that the grave diggers who came to work that morning were all told to take the day off. And we actually talked to one of those gentlemen and he said when he got to his work in the morning, There were police cars and sedans all over the place, so they knew something was going on. At that point, all of the employees were sent home. Mr. Story, meanwhile, had been fired by Joseph Maskell one Christmas Eve. How nice was that? So he's no longer living there. He's off working somewhere else. The archdiocese brings in its own, I don't know if it was their own equipment, but their own person to dig everything up. And the police officer that is called Deep Throat shared with me or with our group that when he got there, he knew that the guy was digging in the wrong place because Story told him where everything was buried. So he said, that's not the right place. He also remarked that there were like tire tracks from the backhoe loader over the accurate place, but that wasn't where they were digging. So what he did was he had somebody go and get Mr. Story off of his job. Story came back. Whoever was working for the archdiocese was asked to get off the piece of equipment. 
story got on, bingo, he's in the right spot. So if you're looking at the video, you see how large that hole was. My supposition is that the bags and the papers that you're looking at, if you can think about them being in a pile in a basement, if they're the first ones into the hole, then maybe they were the last ones thrown on the pile. So that hole was full of materials that looked like what you're looking at. We also were able to enlarge one of the documents and saw that it was the Holy Cross Parish Directory, and that would have had the names and addresses of every single person in that parish. How convenient for a pedophile priest to know where everybody lives and their phone numbers. And most of the other materials, as I said, were psychological tests that he was not permitted to give. Now, where did he get this stuff? There was another gentleman, not sure I'm going to call him a gentleman, named Dr. Urban, who was a psychometrist that the archdiocese had a contract with him. And he would visit different schools and he would administer tests and he would interpret the results. So apparently he and Masco were friends. I've talked to Dr. Urban. He died this past year, so Gemma can't talk to him anymore. He told me that he expected my call and that he was very sad about what happened and what a great job we did with the keepers, but that he knew nothing. Now, I've talked to fellow Keogh friends who said they remember Urban either giving them tests or being present when Maskell interpreted the tests for them. And of course, the results were always skewed and the girls were told they were stupid. They were never going to become anything. The other thing was that Urban and Maskell could have looked at the accurate scores and determine what girls would be most susceptible to approaching and grooming. And that is a very sad comment for me to have to make, but it is what happened. Urban was part of this whole picture. And it looks like when all this was dug up, it was supposedly taken to an evidence room in Baltimore City Police Department. We have been told by an ex-officer who worked there at the time that indeed Around 2000, one of the hurricanes flooded that evidence room. Now, my first question is, why did it just sit there for 10 years? My second question is, what happened to it when it was flooded? Because, friends, if it was underground in plastic for two years and in mud and it wasn't damaged, then the stuff was still readable. There's nothing there like hair and fibers that you would worry about being damaged and not being able to be read. Those papers were readable. So we've always wondered, where the officer friend told me, if evidence is damaged, it has to be destroyed because of mold. And that will impact any accuracy in evaluating that evidence. So let's say it was destroyed after it was flooded. But I've also heard from someone that It may have been moved into a storage container at the FBI storage facility at Fort Meade. Now, in the last couple weeks, I've heard that, no, it was at Fort Holabird. So we still have a big question mark about this. Yeah, and also I will add that although in the video you don't see photos, We do believe there were photos present. Not only does Mr. Story say that he took some of the photos and used them for blackmail, Deep Throat says that he saw photos. Of course, Sharon May says that she did not see photos of these children. That's a whole different story. Yeah, I'd like to add that Sharon May was there the day of the cemetery dig. Not the burial, but the dig up. Yes. She was there. And the keepers, you'll remember her driving her brand new convertible to the cemetery. We would love for Sharon to talk to us and give us her version of the story. And we really don't use censorship and we 
would promise not to judge her because we would just like to hear what she would have to say on interrupted. And we have reached out, but Shane received an email that she would not be interested in doing. At one point, did Teresa tell us that there were photos of her that she was told was in those boxes? Yes. She was under the impression or her attorney during the Doe Row case told her that there was a whole box of just things about Teresa. And that would have been who knows what documents, photographs. She said she wants her box. And it probably, we don't know what happened to it. We know that Judge Kaplan probably had a chance to look at it. But what happened to it after that? Because if that was dug up, and all of this happened around the same time as the Doe Road case was coming into focus. Somebody knows where that box is. I remember once this said, or maybe Tom Nugent commented that Phil Dantes, who was one of the attorneys during that time, said, those documents are somewhere in my attic. But I agree with Teresa. That would be firsthand evidence. And for some reason... Use your imagination. That's not available anymore. I'll also add that you notice that in the video, all that stuff is in big black trash bags. That's weird that they'd be destroyed. But also you'll remember in the keepers that there was a segment where Abby was trying to find out what happened to the box. And there was a, in the, within the paperwork, it said there was a box of exhibits, but she couldn't locate those box, that box of exhibits. Abby went to the archives in Annapolis, in Maryland, to try and find everything she could on the Doe Row case. I went with her the first time, and we found the the person that provides the materials for you was able to find two of three folders. Abby went back on her own, and we went with Tom Nugent one day, and the third folder showed up. And Abby, bless her heart, she's so smart and is so into research. She would be able to look at a document and know, she's not an attorney, but she would know if it was significant or a copy of something. I wept most of the time because it was so sad what I was reading and I was really losing focus on why we were there. But when she went back, the time that you saw her speaking to the woman at the desk, That box of exhibits, whatever that means, was missing. So we don't know what happened to it. I can say that after this happened, we understand, and this is urban legend maybe, but since everybody's dead, I'm going to say it anyway, (laughs) that Joseph Maskell that day flipped out and had a panic attack and a tantrum on the kitchen floor in the rectory of Holy Cross when all this stuff was dug up and that Father Woy, W-O-Y, which is is familiar to many of you, I call him the archdiocesan fixer. He escorted Maskell out of the Holy Cross rectory and at some point Maskell went to live with Robert Hawkins at the St. Rita's Parish in Dundalk. And we know that nearby, the police department and the fire department, they would all mix it up with Maskell and and Lieutenant Skinner. So just one little additional piece of information. Important piece, mate. But thank you again, everybody, for listening. And do you want to give a little idea of what we're going to be doing in the next couple weeks based on our trip yeah so this will be the last time during this trip that i'm recording with Gemma in her house but wednesday we were we had i don't want to say the pleasure but we were able to go into baltimore yeah we had the opportunity to go into baltimore and visit a lot of people who we've interviewed and visit a lot of the important places that happened not only in Kathy's case, but also Joyce's case. So in the future, you can look forward to hearing from the Maleckis, hearing more information about Kathy's case and Joyce's. And yeah. 
What else do you have to say about that, Gemma? I thought it was really productive, but as a teacher, I had reservations about it because this is not a happy field trip. And I so love and respect the people who were willing to give us their time that day. And we're going to talk about where we went and what happened, but we are going to make a personal request from all of you, because if you're on this uh, podcast page, you know that the standards for respect and kindness are probably higher than any place else. We're going to ask you not to try and visit any of the places we talk about. Many of them are on private property that we were given permission to visit. Or federal property. Exactly. <laughs> federal property. And we were escorted by a federal ranger to Joyce Malecki's body was found. So please, if you care about us and the mission and this journey and Kathy and Joyce and other people from the Keepers, just please do not go to those places. We're not, we took a few pictures. This is not the, homes of the Hollywood stars. It's really sacred ground. And a lot of it was really sad. And I know you're curious, but please just respect those people who own those places. We don't want you to get arrested. We had permission and we were with law enforcement and we were with people who own those places. Don't get yourself into trouble and just please keep loving and caring about the people who suffered. I'll add also, just in closing, that in the times when people do go visit those locations, it makes it much harder for people like us to be able to visit them in the future because they get so many people who start trespassing. And then the people, not only the owners of the property, but the people in the neighborhood and the community start to distrust other people who are suddenly showing up for... And we're not saying we're special and we deserve to be there. In fact, a lot of the places had changed drast drastically since The Keepers was filmed. I couldn't believe it. But we're doing this to find out what happened. We're not doing this for entertainment. We want you to help us, and we can crowdsource, and you've done a great job with that. But we're not special. We're just doing this for a reason, not to just be driving by yeah. rubbernecking. And also... We do get more information and new tips and things. And so a part of that may include that we might need to go back to a certain place to see something different that we didn't see before. And it, it, it can make it much harder for us to be able to be granted access to do that if so many people are flocking and trespassing. That's also something to keep in mind because when we do receive new information, we don't want to release it unless we can verify to make sure that it at least seems like it could be accurate based on what we know and what people are telling us. Thanks, everybody. Keep the faith. We're going to see this through with you.